Hey there, how organized are you with your money? Can you find what you need to find when you sit down to do one of those money dates I'm always telling you to do? We're gonna answer this question about how to get amazingly organized, how to really put yourself in a position to activate your actions with money on this show. Your relationship with money matters. I'm Michelle Perkins, and this is the Money & You podcast, where I will be breaking down your relationship with money, offering tough love money tips, and a money dating plan that will focus on lifting the barriers to success to help pave the way for better money practices and increased wealth. It's time to take control to live a limit-free life. It starts today. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Money and You Show. I'm Michelle Perkins, your host. We have a great show for you today. We are going to get back to some basics, actually. And if you're super advanced and you're listening to this, stay with us because I know this show is going to help anyone at any level, at any stage of your financial development. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics of knowing your numbers and organizing your finances so that you can make great decisions from that point. Honestly, you can't really do much without those two pieces. And a lot of people are staying away from that. They don't know their numbers and they aren't paying attention. That's all part of your relationship with money. If you're not paying attention to your numbers, if you don't know where things are, if you're, that's called avoidance. And avoidance usually comes from having uh, a poor relationship with your money. Once you have a good relationship, you're paying attention to it a lot more. And that's what we focus on a lot here. I'm going to bring in a great guest to talk about this today. Her name is Judy Heft. And Judy is the founder and president of Judith Heft and Associates, celebrating over 27 years of helping high net worth individuals and small businesses with bookkeeping and bill pay. She's an author, financial organizer, bookkeeper, and much more in her role as a professional and personal finance, financial organizer. Judy combines her talents and experience in organization and financial assistance, recognizing the unique needs of each of her clients. Judy steps in with customized organization services, including bill paying, financial record keeping, tracking of expenses and contributions, and related correspondence with banks, vendors, insurance companies, and healthcare providers. She's the host of the podcast, Mastering Your Financial Life, in which she interviews professionals who also help others successfully manage their financial lives. Her books, How to Be Smart, Successful, and Organized for a Better Today and Tomorrow, and Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles, How to Successfully Manage Money in Every Decade of Life, are available on Amazon. Judy, welcome. Thank you, Michelle. I'm so thrilled to be here and talk to you today. I'm super happy. I, when I read your bio, I got even more excited because, um, you know, I have a program uh, that I do with people called Your Money Date, which is basically uh, 10 dates that we go on together, me as chaperone and you learning to relate better to your money. The initial modules are really what you do. Um, and so I'm really excited to dig or deep into that, uh, knowing your numbers, what that means for people, how they can best do it, and organizing. That That's that's one of those things that gets overlooked. And you people jump over all of that and start making big money decisions and investing in things and all of that, but they don't really know very much. And they certainly aren't organized enough to find the information they need. So tell us a little about your background and why you do what you do. And, and then we'll jump in. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So I'm celebrating 27 years in business this year, which I'm pretty excited about. And you know what, I started out doing bookkeeping and bill pay for seniors. And I was also at the time doing some home office organized. And then I realized I saw how messy people are. <laughs> I didn't really start out that way. I have to back up a little. I started out, I was an entrepreneur. I had my own family business, a retail clothing business. And mm -hmm. I learned how to do bookkeeping and organize my money, the old fashioned double entry ledger way, you know, with pencil and paper <laughs> before we used computers. And now we have so many wonderful programs like Quick and Home and Business and Mint and even an Excel spreadsheet spreadsheet. So, you know, we try to uh, help our clients get organized and get their finances organized. So many people I have found do not have a handle on their finances. They don't know how much they spend. They don't balance their checkbooks. They think if they go online and look at their bank balance that that tells them what they have. 
But it's not as bad today because we're not writing as many checks as we used to. But still, if there's outstanding checks, of course, you know, that balance isn't correct. So we, you know, for our clients, we use things for personal bookkeeping. We use Quicken Home and Business or, you know, for personal people could use Mint or Excel. Like I said before, there's lots of different programs out there to help you. And, you know, the way we approach it is running a household is really like running a small business and you need to know your numbers. You know, that's what we try to help our clients figure out. Thank you. And you're right. It is like running a small business. And and if you are an entrepreneur listening to this, um, it's very interesting, too, how when you have a business and you think of yourself as a business owner, you can still be very unorganized with your money because you're focusing on the services or the products or whatever and not focusing uh, so much on that. And um Tell me a few of the things that you have found out there that, that you see that are really problematic for people uh, as they try to understand their money. Well, I think the first thing is people don't pay attention. You know, they trust the banks, they trust the credit card companies. And so they don't look at their accounts. You know, they don't know what's going on in there and they miss things because let's face it, banks and credit card companies make mistakes all the time. So one of the things that I like to do is I usually go online every morning and check my credit card statements and my bank statements to know. So I know exactly what's going on. And then weekly, you know, and this is what we do for all our other our clients, too. We download that and we use either QuickBooks Online or Quick and Home and Business and then we categorize it so that every month at the end of each month when your account is reconciled, you really can look at that and know exactly what did you spend? What was your mortgage? What are your utilities? How much did you spend on groceries? You know, what are you saving? Have you put any of that money away? What about kids expenses? You know, there's so many activities. So really, I think Having a real handle is, uh, you know, looking at your accounts on a regular basis and knowing what's coming in and knowing what's going out. You know, over the years, I've seen so many people that I've met, you know, especially when people are contemplating divorce and then there's the non-moneyed spouse, they don't have a clue. They don't know user IDs. They don't know any passwords and they really don't know what they're spending on each category. So it just gets all... Mm -hmm. I don't know. It gets messy because <laughs> they really don't know. That's really hard to tell. And you have to have a handle on your finances. You do. I love that you brought that up because the, there are a lot. I wish I knew a percentage of scenarios where there is one person taking care of the money and especially in a in a couple mm -hmm. um they get very comfortable with not knowing anything, which would drive me crazy personally. I'm with you. I look at my accounts every morning and I but did you know that. What, Michelle, I wasn't always like this when I was married. I've been divorced for quite some time. But when I was married, there was a lack of communication between us. We didn't sit down and have family meetings, which I think is so important. And I've learned that, you know, on my own over the years that you really need to communicate you know it's yes. you know we would take turns like you know he'd pay the bills for like a year or two and then he gets sick of it and he'd give it to me and <laughs> i did but we never talked about any of it yeah. it was just let's get these bills paid and then when the money wasn't there which was part of our problem you know it was just a bigger mess than it was so oh yeah. absolutely and and i get that I, I think what you're saying is that cash flow was a problem um and absolutely. because that is a problem for so many people and i agree especially if two people are interacting with the accounts. They're both spending in different places. And I mean, there's almost no way to manage cash properly when that's happening. Um, Especially if they have different styles. Like, you know, we all, we bring our habits from our childhood to our adult life, what we learned. Maybe we didn't even know that we had those habits and styles, but that's what our examples were. Our parents did it one way or a grandparent or someone mm -hmm. else that was, you know, a godparent, someone else that was taking charge. And so we just, copied doing what they did over the years and that wasn't always the right way we really right. needed to talk about it yeah absolutely and and again we do money the way we do other relationships we do bring the beliefs and ideas from what we've seen in our past or around us and and that becomes our, our you know th those become the belief systems that we run with we don't really question them we just think that's, that's the way so it true. is that's our standard right we right. think that's the way it's supposed to be yeah and money is, you know, money's interesting because it seems very logical and but it but it can be a very creative area. There's a lot of play within the the financial world. I mean, the financial world might have you not believe that, but I believe that that you can create something and I think there was something in your bio 
uh, you know, that works for you as an individual. And just like I think it's said that you work with your clients as individuals. I mean, everybody's unique. Everybody's patterns and belief systems are unique. So you can't force a formula on someone and, and expect that to work. I think that Actually, I've never thought about this before, but what you were saying about the couples, you know, that's hard for couples because one person thinks it should be a certain way and the other person. So it is easier to sort of take control. And what happens in that communication that results in people not wanting to communicate? I mean, I have my own thoughts on that. But why do you think people don't communicate? Because in general, they don't. I think fear. Fear mm -hmm. is a big factor because maybe one partner is a spendthrift and the other one is very conservative and let's say frugal even. And so they, the spendthrift partner doesn't want to tell the other partner what they're doing because they're embarrassed or they have a fear around or whatever the case may be. So they stop communicating. And, you know, I've seen that happen a lot. It's, it's really upsetting when it they is. don't communicate because that's really, like you said, it could be a breakdown of the marriage. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that money plays a huge role in how happy a marriage is going to be. And so, you know, just I mean, if you're anybody listening to this conversation, I hope is taking away that that communication is crucial. It's not really an option if you want to have a happy marriage and a good financial life. And so, um, you know, it's 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 really interesting. So a great point that people do need to communicate. Um it does help if there's an outsider like you doing some of the work for people because there's almost a forced conversation about it um, with you involved. So, and, and I also loved what you said because if you do something regularly, it becomes easier. So when you first uh -huh. think about, oh, you know, overseeing your expenses, that just sounds so overwhelming and icky. But when, when you do get on and look at it regularly, it becomes so much simpler. You get used to seeing certain things. You know when something is, you know, not right or out of place or extraordinary. So um, I, I do love the consistency idea of, of looking at your numbers uh, like you are. Um, it is interesting to think back I, I, the trust thing that you brought up, I think, is fascinating because we do trust institutions. Now there's so much fraud and on all of this stuff, and we're so used to getting the call from the bank or the credit card company that it almost causes us to be more lax in a way because we figure, well, if something happens, somebody will call right. us. But that's not the case. Right. Gives us a little anxiety, too, sometimes. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So but it's good. I mean, it's frustrating, all that extra security, but we need it, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and I want to talk about the, um, you have to be organized in order to do this. I mean, just like you said, when, when your finances are just all over the place and everything's a big mess, you just cannot, uh, it is overwhelming. Then, then it is icky to try to look at your numbers and keep on top of things. So what do you do to help people get organized um, in a way that will help them? Yeah. So, you know, the first thing we do is, so we get a lot of clients that come to us, they haven't paid their taxes in a couple of years. They haven't reconciled their bank statements. They just a complete mess and they don't know where to begin. And the first thing we do is we go back and we take a look at that. And, you know, we, I like to say the word spending plan or the words mm -hmm. instead of budget. So yeah. we help our clients create a spending plan and really take a look at it. And then when we're doing that, we have a tendency to find a lot of, um, you know, I think I'll call them mistakes, I guess. You know, I think that I know I've done this in the past myself. You sign up for something online, you see it. And it's like this wonderful cream and you're going to buy it and you're going to look as gorgeous as Jennifer Aniston <laughs> and all you have to spend is five dollars. And so you do it. But you don't see that little tiny check mark in there that said, check this. And then for the rest of your life, we're going to charge you eighty five dollars a month. And yeah. you go, oh, and the next thing you know. It's, you know, that's happening and or you're getting this thing mailed to you every month, but you don't take the time to do it because you think, well, it's not that much money. I'm not going to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the things that we do when we get started with our clients. We do a little forensic bookkeeping and we kind of look to see, you know, is this legit or is this something that, you know, was a mistake? Mm -hmm. I had a client a while ago who had teenage children and the boys were playing these online games and they didn't realize that every time they clicked on something, they were spending money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was through, this was, you know, I don't think it would happen as much today, but you still have to be careful. And it was, you know, a couple of thousand dollars that was spent this one month through mm -hmm. iTunes. You know, luckily yeah. we caught it. We were able to get the money back. 
by explaining what the situation was. But, you know, you really need to keep an eye on these things. And it's worth the few minutes or hour that it's going to take you to figure it all out. And if you Mm -hmm. can't do it, you know, that's what we do for our clients, too. Right. So we're happy to look into that. Yeah, because it is easy to just keep moving it on the to-do list. You know, next month I'll look at this stuff, and then before you know it, a year's right. gone by and nobody's looking. Yeah, at especially it. for minor things like if it's a ten dollar thing, or you know mm-hmm. what, people forget to they they don't cancel their gym memberships, mm-hmm. those types of things. So mm-hmm. that's really there's a lot of leaks that we find when we get started with our clients. Right, right. What sort of tips do you have for people? Because I I get questions a lot about, especially for the uh, the people who have not been managing the money or whatever, they want to know how best to pay bills. I mean, it's such a simple thing, but what are some tips for people for best practices? I mean, nobody wants late fees and interest and things like that, obviously, but, uh, you know, what what system and structure do you set up or would you have them set up? Yeah, so some of the things, you know, I, I don't like automatic deductions every month, you know, on mortgages or something like that, that stays the same. That's great. But for your utility bills that change every month, I mean, I think cable changes it every month, you know, a few pennies here and there to screw up your books. So those I don't like on automatic because we want to take a look at those bills especially credit cards. I don't like to see credit cards on automatic either because credit card companies, like I said before, make a lot of mistakes and it's really best to get those bills and look at them. And if there's an issue and you can't dispute it, you pay the bill and then you can always dispute it next month if you know that that's what it is. So I think, you know, whether you're using an electronic filing system or a paper in your home, you know, if you're getting paper bills, put them in a folder and know what the due dates are and maybe put on your calendar, you know, it's the first of the month I had to pay these bills. And then, you know, the 15th of the month, I have to pay the rest of these bills. So have it organized so that you don't forget. But I still like uh, going online every day and taking a look at the balance mm-hmm. and see what's in there. I think yeah. that's really I do that. And I did that. I started doing it out of necessity because there would be too many emergencies. I was managing, you know, some businesses as well as personal. And I would get too many calls from the bank, like something is about to not go through or whatever. And so every day I would get on because I would be transferring from a, you know, I'd have an operating account and a credit card account Mm -hmm. and be transferring money. I'll tell you one of the things I do that's a great little uh, tool I picked up about. I've actually been doing it for about six or seven years. It's called Profit First. Mm-hmm. You know, I, mm-hmm. what that is, is, you know, when it's for great for running a business, but I really feel you could do that for your personal uh, accounts too. So whatever is coming in goes into the one income account and then it gets allocated by percentages into the other accounts. Like, you know, that you're going to pay estimated taxes every quarter. Well, f- you know what that is usually because your accountant will give you the vouchers in the beginning of the year. And so you take a look at that and then you, you know, you make sure that you have that separate account or when the income comes in, whatever percentage that has to be goes into the tax account. Or, you know, if it's a business, you know, put that money into your draw or you have, you know, an operating account, which can be used for personal and business. It's where you're paying your main bills out of. So I like that process. And I, I think it's this kind of thing. It takes a little time because you're doing the allocations and the transfers, but it's really worth it because you never have to rob Peter to pay Paul, that Mm -hmm. tax money that you have to come up with is always in there and you don't have to worry. I mean, before I started using this program, I was always, you know, scrambling in April and like, oh, my goodness, I have to pay my taxes. I got to try to borrow that money from somewhere else where I put it and put it here to pay it. And now Mm -hmm. whenever tax season comes along, I have that money put away because I planned for it all year. I think planning is really important. People think of planning as more planning for your future. And this is part of planning for your future, but it's more like your day to day planning, yearly annual planning that you need to know so that you know, these bills don't come as a surprise. I love that. I agree. I don't like surprises in the financial world. (laughs) I like them in other parts of my life. (laughs) Birthday uh, surprises are good. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Right. True, true. Um, So, but I love that. And so what about other things? Like, you know, if you're, I mean, saving for taxes is fantastic. What about vacations and emergency fund and all of that? Is that part of the budgeting that you do for people? 
Absolutely. I think the most important thing is to get that six month emergency plan put away. Mm -hmm. You really need that money to, I mean, especially we, we learned that with COVID, you know, people were out of work, restaurants were closed. Anybody in the service business didn't work for minimum of six months. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that was pretty scary for a lot of people that hadn't planned for that emergency. So I think that's also part of those allocations where you figure out what that percentage is and you put that money into a separate savings account, for instance. So you've got that money there. You know, and then, you know, your your operating account, even though it's not a business account, it's still your operating where you're paying your mortgage and your other important things. Mm -hmm. And I love the reminder of the thing of the vacation bucket. I think that one's really important, too. We have that, too, where you just know, like, all right, I'm going to allocate X amount of dollars for vacations this year. And this is, you know, I'm going to put it away. So when I'm ready to make that take that vacation, I have the money there and I can do what I want to do. Yeah, it's it's a great way to go. And I know people have credit cards. So sometimes they think, you know, I'll just put that vacation on a credit card. But that does I've done it. It doesn't work nearly as well. It's a bit of a panic situation after the fun vacation. Um, But you can still put it on your credit card if you got that money put away to pay that credit card immediately. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, that's great. And and I'm glad you brought up the six month emergency fund. I am a bigger partly COVID you know, put the big exclamation point on that one, too, for me. Um, But now I'm also uh, taking care of my parents. And I fortunately, I have a pretty flexible schedule with what I do. And um, but it would be some I'm in a situation where I probably would have had to take time off. So I thought, you know, it's not there's a lot of reasons. I always think of it as, you know, losing your job. So you need the emergency fund. But that emergency fund uh, can come in pretty handy when you're taking care of people as well or for whatever reason that you have to take off work. Um, So that's so true. I hadn't thought about it. And that's yeah, that's a good point. Whether you have to take off work to take care of your elderly parents or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Or a child or any. I mean, it's it's just yeah, really child. important to have that. It's more important. Uh, it, it, we all paid lip service to it before <laughs> before COVID. But now it needs to be part of your regular budget. And what I like about it is there's an end point. Once you've saved the six months, you can go on. A, you're in the habit of saving and then you can save for something right. else, you know, so or invest or whatever so it it, again these habits are so crucial and what you're helping people do is develop really great habits in a lot of areas Um, and so one of the other things that we do is uh, because you just reminded me when we were mentioning credit card debt or credit card expenses but debt and credit cards is something that's really been an issue is like how do you get people to get out of debt like what credit cards should they pay down first you know pay we recommend pay the one with the highest interest that snowball effect and then keep paying the other ones till you're out of uh, credit card debt and you know we recommend and most of our clients do this only charge what you know you can pay for at the end of the month because you don't want to be paying interest charges on your credit cards because most of them are pretty exorbitant these mm-hmm. days. It's not mm-hmm. really worth it. I mean, I guess the thing is, you know, do I need it? Am I really going to want this thing or can I live without it? Right, right, exactly. And and usually if you wait 24 hours, <laughs> yeah. you have a, a little bit of a different feeling about it. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, credit cards are, are super interesting. I what, what is your overall stance on them? I'm not a person who believes, you know, never use debt. It's debts help me, you know, or credit anyway, has helped me a lot in my life. So I do think you have to be intentional and, and manage it and know what you're doing. Again, it's that knowledge thing. A lot of people don't realize as, as crazy as it seems, but how credit cards work. So, Correct. you know, educating yourself on that uh, is mm-hmm. is very important and knowing what your what interest rate you're paying and uh, all the stuff. But but do you have sort of a general philosophy on using credit? Well, I try not we try to recommend people and I personally do this not to buy anything on credit that I can't pay for. Mm-hmm. Because I don't want like I said earlier, I don't want to be paying interest, exorbitant interest on something. You know, you buy something on sale and then you don't pay it for three months, you know, pay for it for three months. The next thing you know, is more than it was at original price. So, right. yeah, you know, I, I'm not a fan of using your credit cards to live on. Yeah. But it, if in an emergency and you need to charge something, but it's really best to know that you can pay that off mm-hmm. within mm-hmm. the month when the bill comes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little about the, the organizing thing because... Um, uh, again, taking care of my parents, I had to step in and, and suddenly take over their financial lives, which um, 
they were pretty organized. They had a file cabinet. Things were labeled. They had little books with all the passwords and user IDs in them, which was amazing, although some of some of it I couldn't read. Uh, but, um, you know, I've really realized that it, this all has to be documented. And so how do, how do you suggest people uh, start getting organized and, and how they would handle that kind of thing? Sure. So it depends on whether or not you're using paper files or you have digital files. I mean, with the digital files, they should be mirrored after what you would use if you were using paper files. But some people are just more comfortable actually saving the hard copy. You know, so I just think, you know, remembering what you can throw out, you know, we're working with a 98 year old woman right now that has tax return from 1955. Uh, <laughs> so we're trying to explain to her that she doesn't need that. And I think people are afraid to throw stuff out or shred it. That would be shredding, but still. So I think, you know, knowing what you have, like that you don't need to save all those old warranties and old bank statements from years ago seven years is really enough to save cancel well we don't get canceled checks anymore but copies you know and credit card statements you know we don't recommend saving them you know if you're going to save them digitally that's fine but not save them in paper because honestly if you ever need a copy of a credit card statement you can always get that same mm -hmm. with bank statements you can always get them or brokers brokerage statements so you really don't need to actually save them but you know if you're saving them digitally that's fine but i think that's you know the most important thing is to really like have a good filing system so you know where everything is you know some people want to do by you know, banks or, you know, have the, just say the word bank statements or some people want to have, you know, all the different banks spread out or whatever they have, whatever is comfortable for you. And I think the labeling of the file doesn't really matter. It has to be something that you're going to know. You'll remember where you put it because it doesn't do any good to follow someone else's guidance if you're not going to remember, mm -hmm. you know, what's there and what goes where. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I like kind of, well, now I like an overall summary of what's out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where are the bank accounts? What, uh, where is everything? I mean, what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the investments that I know about wondering, you know, especially with, <laughs> I have old records too from them now. And there are a lot of investments and things that are, are gone. But you, you wonder, you know, if you have to figure out if they really are gone, if they're floating around out there and you need to find them. So all the investment information, too, really needs to be managed because those change over time. And if you're looking at an old uh, summary, you might be missing the information you need. Yeah, you definitely have to keep up with it because things change. And as far as, you know, I, I kind of chuckle a little bit to myself. And this is typical when you said that your parents have a nice, neat book with all the passwords in there. You know, <laughs> passwords have to be changed all the time because mm -hmm. for many reasons, you might forget it or whatever the case may be, or they tell you to change it because they're updating or there's two-factor uh, authorization that's, in, you know, uh, needed. So whatever that case may be. So, but we use something called, well, it's been in the, uh, there were some breaches in it not too long ago, but we're still using LastPass. Mm -hmm. There's one pass out there. And these are great for your computer because they will generate, I call them gobbledygook passwords that nobody's ever going to remember, yourself included. And then when you just click on it, you go into it on your computer and you click on it and it'll open up the web page. Or sometimes it'll ask you to prompt it, but you just can click on a little thing. So that's been really good for um, helping us with cybersecurity and other hacking problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a consideration and that's uh, mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, what about medical records? Because that's something I'm dealing with a lot with too. And I, I am looking at them going, do I need to save these? All this stuff from Medicare, yeah, Social Security? I mean, bills and things from the doctors? No, I don't think you need to save the explanations of benefits. I mean, you might want to save them, you know, if you're expecting a, a medical reimbursement, save it until you get the reimbursement. But I don't really think you need to save them. They don't have any diagnoses on them. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't save those. Yeah. You could if you wanted to just scan them on your computer, but to save them the paper yeah. seems silly to me. What about the, uh, government things like Social Security? What, what should people be thinking about with things like that? 
the state. Well, I would save those. I mean, at the end of the year, once you get your W-2 from Social Security, you can throw all the previous statements okay. out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, you really need to. Those are things that you need to keep. And like I said, tax returns for seven years or any K-1s or anything back up on the tax returns. Anything that you're deducting that's showing up on your tax return, that you need to keep. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to save old utility bills or any of that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's And that's another huge effort to go through and get rid of things. But once you've done right. it, you know, then you can keep up with it. So uh, I do find that when people are trying to go forward beyond these basics and, and, you know, save and invest and do all the fun things that you can do with money, um, without the organization set up, it becomes very challenging and it's confusing. True. It really is so. true. Yeah. And some people just aren't made out to be organized. You know, it's not in all of our DNA. That's true. It didn't used to be in mine. So I don't think it was in my DNA. <laughs> Although I will say my mother was very organized when I rebelled. <laughs> you know, in my teen and 20s, I didn't want to be organized. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I got older, I realized, well, you know, maybe my mother was right on one or two things. <laughs> yeah. No, that's <laughs> a great know. point because I, I do try to teach people how to be more organized, but. Sometimes I think, you know, to your point, sometimes you got to bring somebody else in to do that for you. It's too. Yeah. And I do have people who get very stuck because they just can't wrap their brains around either the budgeting or the um, spending plans or the organizing. And it, it's and overwhelming. It, it is. Yeah. For some people. Uh huh. Yeah. So by all means, as we would do with other things, you should bring somebody in to help you get that going. Uh, yeah, we do a lot of that work. We actually have people down. Uh, on the ground in the tri-state area where we go to people's homes and help them get their mm -hmm. finances organized, you know, figure out what they need to keep, what they need to save, I mean, wow. what they need to toss. And, you know, so we help with a lot of that. And then also, you know, we do some of it digitally too for our mm -hmm. clients that aren't in the area. Wow, that's a very cool service, actually. What mm -hmm. area are we talking about? I'm in the tri-state area. I'm in uh, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey. Okay. Okay. That's great. where I have people. I have my lifestyle concierge people are in those areas. So we help a lot of women, mostly mm. women, actually. I just said women because they are women. Yeah. <laughs> those particular clients. Yeah. That's a great we service. Help men too, of course. Yeah. That would be something that would be really helpful to me right now, actually. Not in that area, but <laughs> that's a good where thing. Where are you, Michelle? I'm in uh, Los Angeles. So, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, but but what, a, what a smart service to offer. So uh, tell us a little about the books that you've written and what what people can learn from those. Sure. So the first book is uh, How to Be Smart, Successful and Organized with Your Money. And I wrote that about five years ago. And what I prior to that, for a few years, I was blogging and doing a lot of blogs. And I thought, you know what? Well, actually, my coach said to me, Judy, you got to write a book. <laughs> so I thought, oh, my goodness, well, how am I going to do that? So what I did was I went back into my blogs and I took the ones that I thought were financial and really would work with the title of the book. And I turned them into a book and, you know, a lot of personal experiences, client experiences in there. And that was great. And now my second book is Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles. I co-authored that with Liz Levy. Uh, who's my CFO. And this one is really interesting because every chapter is a different decade of life. We, you know, we talk about teens, you know, uh, going to college, what you need to know in your 20s and 30s, you know, are you having a baby? And then we get into divorce and planning for retirement and retiring. And at every, the end of mostly all the chapters are checklists that you can use. And they really help you to figure out how to get financial organized. And, you know, what are some of the tips and tricks that, you know, we can help you with, you know, just some of these things that you need to know. So it's been really well received. And I love that the checklists are in there because I think we're really helping a lot of people with that. It's, it's the kind of book where you can just go to chapter five and read chapter right. five if it pertains to you or you jump to 10 or go back to one, you know, whatever stage you're at. I think it's a great uh, manual that way. I love that. It sounds very actionable, which is really what I was hoping today's show would be uh, a way to um, activate because we do, we spend a lot of time learning. We spend a lot of time thinking about it, but we want to get to the point, particularly with money, because time matters with money, where we, we get ourselves doing the things that we want to do to build, you know, financial security or wealth or whatever we're after. 
And um, so checklists are great and tangible things like that that people can use. I have found that they really like. People are grateful for those kinds of things that help them organize their thoughts and, and their actions around this. So that's great. I also love and that one you... One of the things I really like about the book is, you know, I think it's really important for young people in their teens and 20s to take a look at it because that's when we really need to start these good habits. Oh you know, my gosh, money. I just look at my kids 22 and 25 and think if you guys do this right, it's going to be easy. It's going to be easy for you to have the money you want in retirement if you start now. now. Um, and it doesn't take yeah. that much, you know, and I was probably told that when I got my first job, but you know, I didn't do it the right way. And, and um, now that everything's automated, it's that much easier. And Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I hate to use the, maybe the word easy isn't the right one, but to get in those good habits. Convenient. Now. Yeah. Convenient. It's more convenient. Yeah. And, and I love that because I find, and maybe you found this and that's what you were doing, but people, whenever I ask a group of people, you know, what kind of money information are you looking for? What would you like to have somebody coaching, teaching about? They all usually, um, say something about I wish you could teach this stuff to my kids um, and they don't feel qualified to do it themselves you know they could probably pass on a few things here and there but uh, but they really want probably because of the pain they've experienced <laughs> going through life not understanding money but they really want their kids to understand it so I I, I love that you've you know broken this down because different life stages are different when it comes to money. Absolutely. And, yeah. and with the young people, I mean, like you said, with your kids, it's just so important to start young. My kids, yeah. of course, didn't listen to me, but they started <laughs> later. <laughs> Whatever. Why well, would they listen to me? Maybe this yours will listen to me and mine will listen to you. That's the yeah, way it exactly. works. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. what I do. You know, uh -huh. oh, no, you're, I'm your, you're my mother. No, they don't say that. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, it I also, well, of course, now, you know, <laughs> no, no. there are all those TikTok experts. So who needs us? But um, exactly. there are uh, all kinds of other things that happen along the way, too, though. And, um, you, you know, money is a part of your life, but there are different, you know, at, at these different stages, a lot of people midlife go through different things, want to change careers, want to, you know, and so obviously money plays a big, huge role in whether you're able to do that. Um, and, and I'm finding too, this retirement, it sounds like this, this block of time where you just live on whatever you've saved, but it's very different than that. There's a lot going on there too. And, um, uh, so I think it's super important to really pay attention at all these different points and plan, like you said. Um, there's a, you know, I find, found even with my parents who I thought had planned pretty well that we can all plan a lot better uh, for not just money, but, you know, how we want to live at, at certain points in our life and, and what kind of situations we want because they're... Um, they're different. They cost different amounts, too. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of questions that come up and we don't really want to think about these things so much. And I get that. But boy, would it help to have a plan for all of that. <laughs> so Definitely need a plan. Yeah. Yeah. We need plans at all the different stages. We, we mm -hmm. um, the need... plans change. They're not set change. in stone. You know, they're not written in ink necessarily. They change as we change. Mm -hmm. Our needs change. Our lifestyle changes. People become divorced or people become a widow or widower without planning. We didn't plan for your spouse to pass away and leave you. And if you didn't have, you know, a will or set up or trust or anything, it could really cost you a lot. So mm -hmm. you really need to sit down. Like I said, I think the first thing I said was communication. Yeah. Yeah. Most important thing if you're in a relationship and, and, and planning. Yeah. And, and communicating, like you said, with your children. Well, absolutely. And I think what, you know, to, to circle back to the communication thing, the reason if it were just talking about, you know, something that was easy, we'd all be doing it. It's just that there's a huge emotional component to it. And I think that's what we have to recognize, too. Um, and that's a lot of the reason I do the show is for people to recognize this relationship, the emotional reactions and, you know, feelings people have around money and um, to be able to handle that and, and kind of 
get to know and understand that and learn to communicate it, it is an emotional conversation that people have to have and so like any other emotional conversation you, there's some skills needed for that yeah i don't know if people really sometimes i think they don't really understand that money is so emotional it's much more than dollars and cents it really has so much around it yeah exactly that's and i think thing. that's that's a great place to to wrap up because uh you know that is that is what we mean when we talk about your relationship with money it's it's like those relationships with food and other things that are also emotional and so we have to be able to kind of face that you know with some courage because like you said earlier it's a fear thing we're going to have to go yeah. places we don't want to go emotionally not not the numbers so much the numbers wouldn't matter at all except they mean something emotionally to us there so. are triggers sometimes you that's know? right that's brings right. you back to your earlier days yeah exactly so but uh, great message to take this on to do it if you can't bring yourself to do it get some help with it but these are the fundamentals that just have to be done in order to go forward and, and do future uh, things with your money whether that's the vacation or the retirement or whatever it is so so Judy thank you so much for being here please let people know how they can contact you and um, you know the, the various ways to to listen to you and everything else Oh, thank you, Michelle. It was great being a guest here. It was a good conversation. I appreciate good. it. So I can be found on LinkedIn under Judy Heft. <clears throat> Excuse me. My business is Judith Heft and Associates. My website is judithheft.com. That's J-U-D-I-T as in Tom, H as in Harry, H-E f is in frank t.com i can always be reached there uh you can email the uh office at info info at judithheft.com and you know our office number is 203-978-1858 and if you want to talk to anybody just give a call there and someone will be happy to point you in the right direction so thank you so much i really oh and also my podcast i can't forget that <laughs> my podcast is mastering your financial life cycles and that's uh on itunes spotify stitcher it's on my youtube channel i think it's on google or someplace it's anywhere wherever you listen to your um your um, podcast, sorry, uh, you can find me there. So yes, I would love to hear from any of you. If anybody has any questions, please reach out. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so Michelle. much, Judy. Yeah, this was great. And I, I love your, um, you know, you're, you're very relatable. I think people would feel very comfortable asking you questions and talking, you know, about their financial situation with you, which I think is a huge uh, bonus for financial people out there because people, you know, they're Thanks, uncomfortable Michelle. talking to people. So it seems like That's you would great. make them feel very comfortable. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. And I will add that I forgot to mention my books are both available on Amazon. They're on my website, too. Good. So we'll put you. that we'll put that in the show notes, too, with some links. Thank you so, so much. They both sound great. So, thank um, yeah, thank you. And thank you, listeners, for being here. We love having you on The Money and You Show. And you will find us uh, where all the podcasts are found, uh, as well as the Limit Free Life YouTube channel and... Um, Roku. That's the that's the latest one. So uh, so glad you're here. We want you to keep listening to the Money and You Show. Please uh, follow us and subscribe and send us a review if you'd like. That would be great. Love to hear any topics or uh, people that you'd like us to to speak with or uh, discuss. And you can do that by emailing me at michelle at limitfreelife.com or team at limitfreelife.com. And so once again, thank you. We'll see you next week.